Chapter 8, Misapplying God's Mail, A Heavenly Offense Every promise in the book is mine, from Genesis to Revelation. Every chapter, every verse, and every line. This little segment of lines comes from a popular children's song. They offer insight into the subtlety with which music can introduce false doctrine into hearts and minds starting at a very young age. Read this segment again. Is it really accurate to say that every promise in the book is mine? Do all of the promises found within the Bible really belong to you and to me and to everyone without distinction? According to the song, these promises would include those from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Is that true? Or does the truth fall at the opposite end of the spectrum? As we have already studied, God has historically and prophetically made promises to individuals and to groups reserved for those intended audiences rather than indiscriminately applied to all. Unfortunately, very few Christians would take issue with such a simple song. Others might excuse it as an innocuous song because no one really pays attention to the words of songs. Thankfully, for some, words do matter. Still, the vast majority of Christianity would find no fault with the song because they subscribe to the flawed concepts that it sets forth. In doing so, they fail to appreciate the ramifications of such doctrinal corruption. The consequences of such teachings have led many people into grievous error and at times even heresy. Think about it. Regardless of to whom a promise was originally made, it is simply spiritualized and claimed by those to whom God never intended the promise. In other words, believers take something specifically given to others and claim it as though it is their own. Sounds a lot like stealing. On earth, this is a federal offense. Wonder how God takes it. Consider again the original illustration concerning God's spokesman. God ordains specific spokesmen to deliver his words, commandments, promises, etc. to specific recipients. In those messages, God made personal promises to men like Noah, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Jeremiah, Peter, and Paul. Additionally, God made promises to certain groups like the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church of God, 1 Corinthians 10.32. Although there are times when these promises go beyond the specified individuals and their people groups, quite often they do not. While it is true in a general sense that no one individual can usurp any promise given to another, this chapter will focus specifically on the teaching commonly referred to as replacement theology. This teaching, also known as supersessionism, serves as a primary component of the larger system of covenant theology. Although the errors of covenant theology are vast, replacement theology can generally be divided into two major subsets. Number one, suggesting that the church is now Israel. And number two, suggesting that promises given to Israel, both historically and prophetically, now apply in a spiritual sense to the church. Fortunately, the Bible dispels both of these erroneous teachings. In fact, the teaching of dispensationalism, or rightly dividing the word of truth, completely dismantles and refutes both blunders. Is the church now Israel? According to replacement theology teaching, the church now functions as a continuation of the nation of Israel and thus a replacement for them. Therefore, the New Testament church, with a few modifications based upon the teachings of Christ and the apostles, should embrace the doctrines and practices of the Old Testament scriptures. This system is not only built upon faulty understanding of scripture, but also produces some damnable heresies that have destroyed the souls of countless men, women, boys, and girls. Misapplication of Scripture Proponents of replacement theology claim several proof texts by misapplying scriptures such as the following. Romans 2.28 For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Romans 9, 6, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. 
that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And then Philippians 3, 3, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Again, Galatians 6, 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. On the surface, these scriptures look very convincing, so long as one ignores the whole counsel of God. Quite simply, these verses do not teach the replacement of Israel by New Testament believers. Rather, they teach several other important concepts. Number one, the true Jew is one who is not simply a Jew outwardly, but also one inwardly. Number two, the completed Jew is one who was not only born into a Jewish lineage, but has also placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, making him part of what the Bible refers to as the election of grace, Romans 11:5, and thus losing his Jewish identity in the church of God. Footnote number two. In this context, election is not a matter of the New Testament gospel, but a matter of national identity for Israel, Romans 11:28. Everywhere the gospel message traveled, it was rejected by some of God's chosen people. This fact does not preclude the individual Israelite from the necessity of believing the gospel and being saved today. Number three, the New Testament believers share spiritual kinship with Abraham. And number four, the New Testament believers enjoy the benefits of a spiritual circumcision, Colossians 2.11. The chart on page 124 is titled Physical versus Spiritual. Christians and pseudo-Christian groups are increasingly convinced that they should mimic the Old Testament Jew along with their system and form of worship. Many of them do this by re-implementing some form of a priesthood system of worship when God never intended for this to happen. They also incorporate offerings within their form of worship, adding to their loathsome theology they begin to emphasize special religious holy days, like the Feast of Mary, Ascension Thursday, Assumption of Mary, All Saints Day, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, Advent, Ash Wednesday, Lent, Good Friday, Epiphany, Mardi Gras, etc., and also diet restrictions and even sometimes marriage restrictions. Unfortunately, the most extreme religious groups with these false forms of worship have historically been guilty of severely persecuting true biblical Christianity. Those who stood true to God's word or simply withstood their attempts at forced conversions were severely persecuted and sometimes even put to death. Historically, these groups have become the most dangerous when their power and influence was sufficiently able to unite the contrived authority of the church and state. Because these religious political groups have associated themselves with Christ, far too many students of history have identified them as historical Christianity. The chart on page 125 is titled Form of Worship. The Bible says that these groups do err not knowing the scriptures, Matthew 22, 29. One of the most prominent correlations amongst all these groups concerns their failure to recognize Israel's continued existence and future prominence. The book of Romans, among several other passages, indisputably teaches Israel's continuance as God's people after the institution of the church. Romans 11, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people, God forbid, for I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Take note of the twice repeated phrase, his people, used in this church age epistle. This phraseology is both purposeful and revealing of God's heart on the matter. Israel may be spiritually blinded and nationally cut off from the blessings of God, but they remain his people during this age. Can the church usurp the promises of Israel? There are several biblical reasons for rejecting the idea that God permanently cast away the physical Jews and subsequently transferred his promises from Israel to the church. Yet to keep things rather simple, we will consider only two of the consequences associated to such erroneous teachings. First, if the promises given to Israel now functionally apply to the church, the church can and should delve directly into the Old Testament and into the Gospels, searching out the promises given to the Jews. 
Once these promises are discovered, they should unabashedly claim them as their own. Bible students refer to this as spiritualizing Israel's promises and thus forcing them outside of their application to Israel. Secondly, if the church replaces Israel and usurps their promises, there remains no future for Israel. God is simply finished with them. Historically, the proponents of this teaching have been guilty of some of the most heinous persecution of the Jews. Those who suggest that the church takes Israel's promises must do so by neglecting many other New Testament teachings which restate the promises given to the Jewish people. Romans chapter 11 serves as a prime example that completely refutes any such notion. Romans chapters 9 and 10 set the stage for those truths which follow in chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 delves deeply in the description of how the physical Jews have been blinded in part while the Gentiles are grafted into God's place of blessing. Yet this passage also reveals that God's focus and attention will again return to Israel. These truths are completely incompatible with the false teaching of replacement theology. We will consider this chapter from Romans in great detail because of the pivotal teaching contained therein. Number one, Israel's fall and the Gentiles' salvation served to provoke Israel to jealousy. The rhetorical question is asked and immediately plainly answered, has God cast away his people? And the answer is, God forbid, or an emphatic no. Romans 11.1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, and it continues, In Elijah's day, the nation chose Baal over God and chose to be in league with Jezebel. The passage in Romans goes on to say that Elijah thought in his day that there was nothing left of Israel, but God straightened him out by pointing out that although the nation was apostate, there were individuals remaining with a personal relationship with God within that nation. This same mentality was addressed in Romans chapter 11 with the same conclusion drawn. It is easy to prove that Israel's preservation historically is of God and not of their works. Romans 11.11 I say then, have they, that is Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, that is Israel, to jealousy. Why would God choose the church to provoke Israel to jealousy? Although God kept reaching out to Israel, Romans 10.21, they took their national relationship and position for granted. God wanted to provoke Israel to jealousy for the simple reason that he was not finished with them. He took that relationship from them and gave it to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to want that relationship renewed again. On page 127, the chart is titled, natural versus wild olive branches. Number two, because of Israel's unbelief, the branches, that is Israel, were broken off, resulting in thou, the Gentiles referred to as the wild olive tree, being grafted in among the believing Jews. Let's look at the verse, Romans eleven seventeen, And if some of the branches, Israel, be broken off, and thou, the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they, that is Israel, were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear." Some of the natural branches were broken off because of unbelief, but the root, or covenant made with Abraham and his seed, remains intact. Again, Israel, nationally, was broken off because of unbelief as revealed by their actions. Yet the passage does not stop there, but offers Israel's future as it prophesies that they will one day no longer remain in unbelief. Number three, when Israel, individually and consequently nationally, turns to the Lord, they will again be grafted into their rightful place of blessing. The Apostle Paul prophesied this very thing in the first century 
during the church's embryonic stage. Romans 11.23 And they also, if they, that is Israel, abide not still in unbelief, shall be graft in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. Praise God for the future restoration of Israel. These truths, when correctly applied to Israel, as God intended, give no indication, as some teach of any replacement theology being taught by Paul. In fact, Paul was not alone on this matter because God ensured that all of the other writers of Scripture taught the very same thing. On page 128, the chart is titled, Natural Branches Grafted In. Number four, when Israel again turns to the Lord in belief, they will receive God's promised and prophesied blessings, which include the land, healings, and prosperity. Romans continues by explaining when Israel's blindness will end. Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, by stealing Israel's covenants and promises and blessings. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel, a national entity, shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. On page 129, the chart is titled, All Israel Saved. Israel will both be saved and have her sins forgiven nationally, Romans 11:26. Obviously, this is yet future and will certainly be Israel's glorious future. The church has a savior, a redeemer, etc., but Israel has a deliverer. When Jacob acts in faith, he is called Israel. When he acts in unbelief, he is called Jacob. So when God turns all ungodliness from Jacob, all Israel shall be saved. Number five, the material covered thus far should be sufficient to dispel the false teaching concerning the church's replacement of Israel, but there is more. The passage from Romans chapter 11 ends all debate as it incorporates use of the present tense concerning God's covenant with Israel. Romans 11:27. For this is my, that's exclusively God's, for this is my covenant unto them, that is Israel, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. On page 130, the chart is titled, Israel in the Church. God's covenant is still in existence, and its future prophetic fulfillment depends entirely upon God and not upon the nation of Israel. The passage from Romans further reveals the consummation of the covenant as it expresses the future implications, when I shall take away their sins. This prophecy reiterates the prophecy given by Jeremiah a prophecy obviously never yet fulfilled because in Paul's day it was still yet future. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law on their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The Old Testament context of this promised covenant suggests the impossibility of it not being fulfilled. The only means by which Israel can cease to be a nation before God is if God fails concerning the order and ordinances of his creation. Jeremiah 31, 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. All Bible believers know that this is impossible. Replacement theology teachers should exalt the Bible above their man-made philosophies. Number six, 
The context of the focus upon Israel in Romans continues into the next passage. Unfortunately, many preachers and Bible teachers often overemphasize the practical application of the next passage rather than its primary doctrinal intention. Romans 11.29, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The verse in its true context refers to God's promises to Israel. Thus God's gifts and calling concerning Israel are without repentance. This means that God will not change his mind concerning the promises and covenants made to the Jewish people. Unfortunately, those teaching replacement theology make their God into a liar of the worst sort. Number seven, God concluded all Israel in unbelief so that he could extend his mercy to all those in unbelief. That means that he extends his mercy to all, not some subset of the so-called elect. Romans 11.32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. The chart on page 132 is titled, Israel's Blindness Ends. Number 8, Paul said he could wish himself accursed for his kinsmen, those brethren according to the flesh, Israel. Romans 9.3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Take note of the present tense. They are Israelites. And then it mentions the sevenfold privilege that pertaineth to them, also present tense. God forbid that anyone should teach that God has reneged on his promises because our only hope as Christians lies in a God that keeps all of his promises. Time to reject these man-made philosophies. Suggesting that the church replaces Israel requires the most vivid of imaginations. Unfortunately, when one's imagination combines with doctrines built upon sinking sand, the outcomes are disastrous. The reason so many people find it easier to reject the truth of God's word rather than rejecting these man-made philosophies is because these philosophies appeal to man's finite intellect rather than God's holy word. Genesis offers the initial glimpse into God's covenant with Israel. In Genesis chapter 15, God confirmed his promises to Abraham and his seed concerning the land. This promised possession concerning the land was to stretch from the river of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates River, Genesis 15:18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Although King David historically subdued much of this land, it has never all been a part of Israel. Ezekiel confirmed the future possession of this land following the Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel 48, 1 through 35. How can anyone miss this fact? Did God ever promise any land to the church? Are we to organize an army and head to Jerusalem in order to divide and conquer? Some have tried to do this very thing from the conquering Muslims to the Roman Catholics with their crusades and inquisitions, and all have failed. All of this has taken place by either disregarding God's power or by usurping God's promises to the Jews, God's chosen people yesterday, today, and forever. Some teachers with good intentions have taught that because of Israel's disobedience, God changed his mind and nullified his covenants. However, God gave many of his promises to Israel with unconditional guarantees based simply upon the fact that God is faithful. If God arbitrarily fails concerning any of his unconditional promises to Israel, he too could take back the very promises made to Christians. Consider the repercussions of such a position because your very eternity hangs in the balance of God's faithfulness. If God is truly as fickle as replacement theology teachers suggest, the Christian has no sure promise of eternal security or life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1.16. Replacement theology is quite simply a carnal, man-made doctrine that appeals to the flesh. God has not replaced Israel. The Jewish people will turn again to the Lord as repeatedly prophesied throughout Scripture. Likewise, the New Testament believers will receive the promises given to them. 
in the end, we will all be brought together under Christ's sovereign rule in God's kingdom. Truly, his gifts and callings are without repentance. Seed is the sand of the sea. Abraham, while on the mountain with Isaac, received God's promise of supernatural protection and blessing. Abraham's seed will be multiplied as the stars of heaven and the sand which is upon the seashore. Genesis 22:17. Then in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. This promise has never been fulfilled. According to replacement theology, God has failed, will fail, and just simply lied. All are impossible, as is the lack of future fulfillment of such promises. On page 134, the chart is titled, Like the Stars and Sand. The accusation of replacement theology. The Bible points to the devil as the first to call into question God's word, Genesis 3.1, but he was certainly not the last. Those professing replacement theology fall into the same grievous errors, man's arch nemesis, Simply put, if God promised to preserve Israel, and he certainly did, and some men audaciously suggest that God will instead have them replaced, somebody has lied. The issue is not one of sincerity, because there have always been more sincerely wrong people than followers of the truth. Choose whom you will believe, whether the God that cannot lie or men who find truthful consistency so difficult. 1 Samuel 12:22 For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people Psalm 94:14 For the Lord will not cast off his people neither will he forsake his inheritance God repeatedly promised not to forsake or cast off his people we need to read and heed how the Lord admonished Jeremiah to reject man's claims that God had forsaken his people. He told Jeremiah not to even consider the false claims of these naysayers against Israel. Jeremiah 33:24. Considerest thou not what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord hath chosen, he hath even cast them off? Thus they have despised my people, that they should be no more a nation before them. Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Repeatedly, the Bible says that the Lord promised that Israel would be preserved forever. Psalm 37, 28. His covenant with them would be an everlasting covenant. Jeremiah 32, verse 40 says this, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. These truths cannot be clearer or simpler. Every honest Bible student believes that God promises to preserve Israel and likewise promised to maintain his covenant with them forever. To claim that God will not keep his promises to Israel makes God a liar and man his own authority. After Moses died, Joshua became the leader of Israel. He proclaimed to Israel, even after their repeated failures, that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Joshua 23:14. The Lord, during his earthly ministry, confirmed the everlasting nature of God's words, and thus he declared promises when he said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Luke 21, 33. The Lord promised to preserve Israel forever, and unlike man, his promises never fail. The Bible describes God this way. He is not a man that he should lie. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. Whether through intentional design or haphazard interpretation, 
replacement theology mocks the Old Testament promises and the New Testament confirmations of these promises. This system of theology makes God a liar, Romans 3, 4, and attributes to him a slackness concerning his promises, 2 Peter 3, 9. Yet this false teaching is becoming ever more prevalent because some internet or television personality sounds so convincing and authoritative. If God is either slack concerning his promises or an outright liar, he certainly ceases to be holy and ceases to be God. If he is not God, there is no hope for Israel. If he is not God, there is no hope for the church. If he is not God, there is no hope for you. These matters are that pivotal and that crucial and that simple. Praise God that he cannot and will not forget his people Israel. The Bible even says that God has graven them upon the palms of his hands. Isaiah forty nine fourteen. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. The end result of replacement theology. Although we have only addressed a few of the many problems in this chapter, do not underestimate the ill effects of replacement theology upon the New Testament church doctrine. Its teachings have led many astray and seem likely to continue this trend. We could delve into many of the additional and savory facets of replacement theology in much greater detail, such as infant baptism as a replacement for Jewish circumcision, hyper-Calvinism, a limited general resurrection, apostolic succession and sign gifts, the priesthood, church-state religion, or the church enduring Daniel's 70th week, known as the tribulation period, the point to keep in mind is that accepting the foundational teachings of replacement theology opens the floodgates to innumerable doctrinal errors and schisms. The crux of the problem associated with replacement theology involves replacing God's internal method of Bible study with a man-made system. Therefore, we covered one of the most prominent indicators, the church's replacement of Israel in both promise and prophecy. One further element of this false teaching should suffice for any sincere Bible student. The next chapter focuses upon a prophetic element of replacement theology. This system of teaching ill-advisedly includes the church in Daniel's 70th week and the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the end of chapter 8.